and the wall of rain enclosed the courtyard in its clutches, accompanying the chaos of battle. His lizard folk brothers, fallen one by one into the dirt around him, Snapjaw stood his ground against the ever coming bullywogs. For every fallen frog, another two joined the fight. Whatever the outcome, the slavery of his people will end tonight. A battle cry penetrated the rain. Snapjaw lifted his head to see a dark figure against the lightning lit sky. The figure tossed something toward him, and a moment later a head squished into the dirt in the middle of the courtyard. The Bullywog Shaman's head, a grotesque green carved into his ugly face. The filthy frogs hesitated, and Snapjaw slayed one of them with one powerful blow. It's over, Bullywogs. Your leader is slain. Gone. Flee or join him. For the first time, the lizard man saw fear in their eyes. It felt good. <laughs> Castle Nairitar is perhaps my favorite episode of the adventure. It has a somewhat nostalgic spirit to it, a ruined castle in the middle of an enormous swamp with an ecosystem of its own, dragon worshipping lizard folk, evil bullywogs, and the many dangers of mere of dead men. To me, it screams D&D more than anything in this book. It is also probably the first time that the players are given at least a little freedom, as this chapter has a somewhat sandbox quality. Razmir, the half-dragon wearer of purple, has built a fragile balance of factions here in the swamp, and the party are the ones who can disturb this balance in a variety of ways. In its core, this is still a proceed from point A to point B situation, but you can easily make staying here for a while and enjoying the gameplay reasonable. To give your players the reason to stick their noses into the local business, you should let them understand the importance of this place in the scheme of gathering the Horde of the Dragon Queen. Let them realize that a sabotage will cause the cult a lot of trouble and slow them down in the pursuit of their agenda. Before delving any further, I'd like you to hear what the designer Steve Winter had to say about episode 6 of his adventure. The situation in episode 6 is entirely open-ended. We didn't want to script NPCs' locations or motions. Guidance is given in certain cases. Where nothing is said, it's up to the DM. When Razmir is at the castle, she's in charge, and she could be anywhere the person in charge might go. In the library, in her chambers, in the Great Hall supervising the sorting of loot, outside the castle dealing with bollywogs and lizard folk, in her office consulting with Born Grey and Joss, in the dungeon watching loot being transported to the lodge, in the courtyard watching lizard folk at drill. As second in command, Born Grey has most of the same options. The castle is meant to be a site in motion, not a store window display, where everything and everyone is frozen in place until PCs come to attack them. Resmir is definitely at the castle when characters arrive, but she might not be around for long. She evacuates immediately if an attack develops. She leaves within a day or two if characters drag things out. Until castle denizens become aware of the characters' presence, they go about their normal routine. Once they become aware of non-cult infiltrators in the area, they'll react in whatever manner the DM thinks is most appropriate and most exciting for the players. There are too many possibilities for us to enumerate all of them. That's one of the facets of D&D that makes it so brilliant. There's a human brain behind the screen, constantly reacting to the changing situation and intelligently guiding NPCs by weighing far more factors than any remote author or program can account for. So my guidance is internalize the personalities of the principal NPCs and the factions. Look at the developing situation from their viewpoints and have the NPCs do what it makes most sense for them to do. To me, Castle Nairitar is the part where the adventure finally starts to be good as written. And that is why I think that it would actually be reasonable to start from here if you want to jump into Tyranny of Dragons after your players have beaten the Lost Mine of Fendelver or Dragon of Icepire Peak. The Mirror of Dead Men is even featured on the original map of the Neverwinter surroundings in both modules, and with a bit of tweaking you can lead your players into investigating the castle and then just move further on with the Tyranny. There are already cult members in the Lost Mine of Fendelver, but regarding the Dragon of Icepire Peak you can just just as well connect the backgrounds, perhaps justify the presence of the white dragon with the cult activity. A gentleman by the name of UK Racer 36 from the comment section here in the channel suggested connecting the group found in Icepire Castle to the cult of the dragon, which is another fine way to do it. So, regardless of the sandbox nature of Episode 6 Castle Nairitar, there is still a number of important milestones to be followed in order to succeed and progress the story into the next episode. These main objectives are find the castle following the trail, learn about the portal in the dungeon, obtain the key to the portal, and use the portal. 
From the variety of possible secondary objectives, the most obvious one is make friends with the lizard folk and possibly start a riot and massacre everybody in the castle. The rest of the mentioned variety can include so many options like investigating the castle. There are giant spiders, giant centipedes, an otiog that usually consumes garbage, but wouldn't mind eating an adventurer for a change, specters which are former members of the mysteriously vanished Stargazer Academy, whose story by the way we'll discuss a little bit later, an observatory that is guarded by gargoyles and contains a curious magic device called the Farseer of Illusk, and can be used to spy on the Black Dragon and his secret twin brother. Speaking of which, the adventure clearly states against the encounter with the dragon, and so the personality of Wolvergamanther and his reaction to the party if they show up at his doorstep are untold, and even though it's an unlikely event, I would still prepare myself for that. I'll talk about that in the following video where I'll discuss important NPCs of this chapter in detail. A kingdom that stood here long ago was washed away when a lich named Iniarv caused the sea to flow inland. The swamp gets its name from the thousand who died in that flood. Travelers of the high road, which skirts the mere to the east, must resist the urge to be lured into the swamp by bobbing will-o'-wisps. Countless adventurers have perished in the mere, drawn by true tales of ruined castles half sunk in the mire. These once noble estates are now home to lizard folk, undead and worse. The greatest threats to would-be treasure hunters are the ancient black dragon twins, Vorogamanther and Waver Rendor. While the former is considered the undisputed lord of the mirror, the latter is hardly known at all, and the two dragons like it that way. Traveling through the mirror will likely take a fair amount of time. Make sure to do your best to deliver the atmosphere of this place. This is one of the largest marshes in the north, and you want it to be memorable and leave an impression of not just any swamp, but of a mysterious place with almost a personality of its own. You don't have to stretch the travel for several sessions, but I would take my time and have at least two or three encounters that would set the mood. And you want to start by describing how it feels to walk through this squashy dark land, the singing of crickets and frogs, the heavy dampness, the annoying mosquito bites, twisted trees, vines and thick vegetation cloak the mist-shrouded surface of the cold saltwater swamp. Its air is foul with rotting stenches, and its water is black and opaque. Visibility given fogs and rolling topography is rarely more than half a mile. For flightless creatures, travel in the mirror is slow and dangerous. Its dark waters are deep enough to permit a flat-bottomed skiff to pass, but many small islands rise from the swamp tangled with strange vegetation. The overgrown bones of long-fallen creatures lie everywhere. The Mirror of Dead Men is known for its monstrous denizens. Travelers on the high road skirting its eastern verges often travel for three days and nights without stopping to avoid camping within reach of dark, wet, clutching things raiding out of the swamp. Bobbing will-o'-wisps are common night sights from the road. Don't hesitate to provoke your player's imagination by sharing some information about this place that their characters might have heard. Sword Coast lore speaks vividly of floating islands moving in the mirror, lizard folk commanded by liches, drowned ships swarming with sea zombies, gigantic dark tentacles, yuan tea slavers, temples of inhuman gods, giant leeches with bullywug raiders, a huge will-o'-wisp that pulses with dark energy and many other horrors. The book suggests quite a few encounters to pick from, and I should say I'm a fan of more natural ones, like giant frogs or crocodiles, rather than those with humanoids, just because they speak more about the fauna of the place, while we will have an entire session or two to deal with the local societies. But my all-time favorite, I should say, is a combination of will-o'-wisps and some other encounter. Those sneaky spirits can be a magnificent tool to annoy your players, in a good way hopefully, and lure them anywhere you want, to an old tower occupied by a ghost, a patch of quicksand, a shambling mound, and the most extreme, the dragon lair. Even more possible encounters can include insects, ghasts, whites. I found these suggestions in Xenathar's Guide to Everything, and one of them was especially interesting. Tainted water that exposes creatures that move through it to sight rot. Now, sight rot is a disease described on page 257 of Dungeon Master's Guide. Basically, it causes bleeding from the eyes. It's gross, but check it out, it has all the info. In any case, try to get creative and design or adapt the given encounters to suit you most, especially the possible fight with the lizard folk. Try to keep in mind the environment and make this this battle differs somehow from the battle in any other locale. Mud as a difficult terrain, fog to obscure vision, maybe the dampness can affect the behavior of fire somehow. Show that the lizard folk really feel themselves at home here, how they know how to gain a positional advantage, maybe they have some traps already installed for a case like this. And of course, don't forget that they are potential allies, so use your knowledge of your players to subtly make them at least consider that. 
Built by a half-elven wizard years ago, Castle Nairitar is a partially ruined fortification perched atop a low rise surrounded on all sides by a wide moat of stagnant odorous water. When the wizard vanished, various sordid swamp creatures moved in. Years later, the Academy of Stargazers, led by their powerful mistress, Lady Adele Estrelara, wiped out a tribe of bullywogs who had taken residence there and claimed it as their new home. Adele hired workers to muck out the place and build a road from the castle to the high road. They also delivered a large large telescope that Adele had purchased in Waterdeep. With the aid of arcane scrolls and other rare materials purchased in Skullport, she transformed the inner dome of the castle into a magical viewing sphere, which she used to view her murky domain to find victims. Yes, victims. Adele hired adventurers to hunt down the druid vampire, but in reality she only wanted to get rid of an opponent, as she herself turned out to be a horrific vampiric creature, something called a penangolan. Adele had been killing her own apprentices all that time. Eventually she'd gotten exposed and destroyed, and the castle abandoned once again, until a hundred years later when Resmir discovered it during her visit to the Black Dragon. To this day the castle is haunted by the victims of the Star Mistress. The tortured spirits rest quite quietly in the Northwest Tower. At your discretion, these specters can tell their story, begging to be slain and thus released from this place, and in exchange they could share a location of a secret passage, for example, that could help the players in executing their sabotage, or maybe they will tell them exactly where the leaders rest in the castle and help infiltrate their chambers to find something important like the password to the portal. They could also explain exactly how to use the Farseer of Elusk, lowering the DC to use it or getting rid of the ability check entirely. Now, what is the purpose of this location to the cult? If you look at the map, you'll see that the Well of Dragons is basically just around the corner from Greenest compared to all the way up almost near Neverwinter. So why would the cult bother to run a caravan from the green fields to Baldur's Gate to Waterdeep into the castle in the middle of a swamp for a total of 1000 miles, teleported another 600 miles to the east to Great Peak Mountains, load it on a huge flying castle and then fly it south another 350 miles, when the Well of Dragon is roughly just 500 miles away from the green fields? That's more than three times less. The only logical explanation that I can think of is secrecy. The book doesn't really bother to explain the reasoning behind any of this. Why is it safe to raid and burn down entire towns, but not safe to travel straight to the destination? Is it that the Elder Guard is so secure that the cult chooses to travel a thousand miles and make stops in two metropolitan cities with gates that have border control, just to avoid moving through the kingdom? Or if they make friends with dragons, why can't the dragons deliver the loot? Is there not a single dragon who's loyal enough to Tiamat that he won't steal it for himself? She's the dragon queen after all. All that we get from the book is the treasure is headed north on the tradeway hidden in unmarked freight wagons that are part of the regular merchant traffic of the well-traveled road. My best guess is this. The entire campaign of the cult to bring Tiamat to Faerun takes a very long time and requires operations all over the Sword Coast. The cult takes their time and does its best to make all the attacks look like random bandit raids. They don't want anyone to see any sort of traffic going south to the Sunset Mountains, so that no one would even bother to become curious, because it's gonna be months or years before the ritual will begin and they simply can't take any chances. We don't know exactly when the cults started the attacks and where. And so having such a remote outpost as Nairitar first of all gives the cult the time to react to potential threats, like a group of undercover detective adventurers, and even though the cult will eventually likely fail, you know, they've tried. Second of all, as it was mentioned, the loot is being streamed from various directions and the chances somebody will notice it on trade routes are much lower than if it all went south to a dead volcano. That would look far more suspicious. But with the portal in the middle of the swamp, even if an army will come and say, aha, the cult will shrug and say, what treasure? We're just researching the local species, or restoring the observatory. I'm exaggerating to make a point, you get it. The loot is suddenly in the Great Peak Mountains, and nobody's going to notice a flying castle above the clouds that can magically weave a veil of fog around itself on command. As you can see, you can bring logic to anything if you want. I just wish that the authors bothered to clarify some of it in the overview. It would literally take less than a page. Maybe I'm wrong and I'm either missing something or all that I've said is obvious. But still a lot of DMs that I've encountered on Reddit, Facebook and different forums struggle to grasp everything about the cult's activity. That's why I make these videos in the first place. In the next video we're going to take a really close look at the major NPCs in Castle Neyritar and the atmosphere inside of this place. It's very 
important since it's likely the first time the players will get a chance to actually speak to higher ranked cultists. What information can be acquired in this episode? We'll find out very soon. 